Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. In a new development on the impasse on Iran nuclear deal, Iran's Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif suggested a way out for the U.S. and Iran in a statement on Monday. Zarif said that instead of a sequencing issue about who should go first in returning to the 2015 deal, a top EU official could synchronize his words or choreograph. That's also the term he used, the moves. Both Iran and the U.S. want the other to resume compliance first with the agreement. The U.S. walked out of the deal under former U.S. President Donald Trump in 2018, and Iran has been taking calibrated steps towards non-compliance with the deal, insisting that sanctions must be lifted before Tehran returns to full compliance. President Joe Biden has indicated that he will rejoin if Iran resumed strict compliance. Iran has so far insisted that strict compliance is contingent upon the U.S. lifting sanctions against it. Zarif's stance is a shift from his position expressed in a January 20, 22nd article in which he said the United States would remove U.S. sanctions before Iran returned to the deal. Speaking to CNN, when asked how to bridge the gap between the two positions, Zarif said, and this is a direct quote from him, there can be a mechanism to basically either synchronize it or coordinate what can be done." Unquote. In the same interview, Zarif also rejected a statement by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that Iran could be about three to four months away from breaking out, saying if we wanted to build a nuclear weapon, we could have done it some time ago. To discuss this further, I have with me Mustafa Khoshchashm, a journalist and analyst who has taught at a number of Iranian universities and academic centers, Dr. Carl Colton Thala, professor of political science at the University of Akron, and Dr. Kamran Bukhari, director of analytical development at the Center for Global Policy. But before I get to the panel, a couple of points need reiteration. One, with reference to Blinken's statement about the breakout time. He said that he was basing it on information in public reporting. So the timeline may not be accurate. In fact, Israeli Energy Minister Yuval Steinitz in a radio interview said, and I'm quoting from uh, how it was reported, in terms of enrichment, they, as in the Iranians, are in a situation of breaking out in around half a year if they do everything required. As for nuclear weaponry, the range is around one or two years. Second point, even if the sequencing issue can be worked out, what kind of deal are we looking at? Now, this refers to, and we've actually done a program on this before, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has indicated inclusion of other parties like Saudi Arabia. Iran has already rejected that. Anyway, so let's get to our experts to see what's unfolding. Let me begin with Mustafa Khoshyash. Uh, Mustafa, let's uh, talk about this new development and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, an overview of sorts before we get to specifics. Um, as a matter of fact, I look at uh, Dr. Zarif's statement as a spontaneous uh, uh, effort to, to salvage the nuclear deal. I do not believe that what he said was had already received the approval of the Islamic Republic. You know, the decision-making uh, is done by top authorities of the Islamic Republic, uh, that includes also the Supreme National Security Council, as well as uh, the whole system, the establishment. And uh, uh, the foreign minister is just responsible for the method to do the negotiation. That's uh, their job, that's their responsibility. But the strategies are specified by the top security body, the SNSC, Supreme National Security Council. And I believe that the Islamic Republic has already uh, clarified its stance on this nuclear issue and the U.S. to the nuclear deal. Uh, Iran's Supreme Leader has also reiterated the same approach, that uh, the U.S. needs to remove all the sanctions first. Once this is done, then uh, uh, Iran would immediately go for uh, reviving uh, compliance with the nuclear deal. So what basically was said by Dr. Zarif has no place in the strategies that I've 
already heard from top Islamic officials, Islamic Republic officials, as well as the uh, decision making the SNSC. Since it's completely different, Iran has raised three conditions, prerequisites. One is that the U.S. needs to remove all the sanctions under Resolution 2231 before even speaking of getting back to the nuclear deal. Second is making up for the damages they have incurred on Iran through their withdrawal from the JCPOA. And the third is providing Iran with the needed assurances that they would not go for the trigger mechanism again. In the meantime, Iran has clarified very uh, in clear terms that it would not go for what by for. He has asked for multiple deals of Iran's missile industry, regional power, human rights issues, Israel, and so on and so forth. And Tehran has stressed that he would not go for any other deal, and it just wants the U.S. to, to remove the sanctions as promised. Uh, because of the experience that we had when this came into force some four or five years ago, uh, that Obama uh, signed a removal of the sanctions, but the secondary nuclear-related sanctions never were removed in action, and Iranian banks could never do their job if they could not even do the SWIFT for one single dollar or a penny. So Tehran has received the lesson, has taken the lesson, and it now demands for a complete removal of the U.S. sanctions in practice, right. not just uh, a signature by President Biden over the paper. So, uh, basically speaking, uh, what I see in Mr. Zarif's remarks is just a spontaneous initiative uh, uh, by the foreign minister to probably salvage the deal. But I doubt if Islamic Republic would endorse that ever. Right. Now, that's a very interesting point. I mean, but, uh, uh, Mr. Khoshesh, before I quiz you further on this, I want to put this to my other experts, starting with Dr. Colton Thaler. Dr. Colton Thaler, uh, is it possible for uh, someone like Jawad Zarif, who is uh, demonstrably a very seasoned diplomat, to have said something uh, especially to CNN? Uh, and if what uh, Mustafa Khosheshma is saying is indeed the case, then it could be that he is signaling not just to the United States, but also signaling back home. I mean, how do you read that? I think it's entirely possible. Uh, I think Mustafa may be exactly right that he's trying very, very hard to salvage the deal. Uh, and, and in my view, the, the, the two main obstacles that are really salvaging this deal are the politics in the United States and in Iran. And both parties who would negotiate this deal want the deal to happen, but they're severely constrained by the politics at home. So, for example, if Iran continues to call for the removal of the sanctions before becoming compliant again, that's kind of a non-starter politically in the United States. Uh, at the same time, uh, Zarif has constraints on him politically at home. Uh, and it's both the public, but more importantly, it's the leadership above him in the Iranian Republic. So I think I think I look at this situation as one where uh, you've got people that really want to get this deal done. They have major constraints on them. This wouldn't be the first time that Zarif has said something that in turn uh, was basically constrained by the people above him in the regime. Uh, so I think it's entirely plausible that this may not actually be the position of the top Islamic uh, government leadership in Iran. Right. Very interesting. Kamran Bukhari, as I said in my opening also, uh, what Zarif said to the CNN is actually not what he wrote in uh, the 22nd Jan article. Uh, what is your sense of uh, why this, this is the case? Uh, Ijaz, um, different messaging, different statements and communiques are issued by uh, diplomats in various forms for different purposes. So uh, that's perception shaping, getting published in foreign affairs. Um, I don't think it's the first time he, he got published there, but the timing, you know, just a few days after the Biden administration took office um, is basically perception shaping. The, the purpose of that statement was to say, OK, this is where we want to be a general sort of 
geopolitical essay of Iranian imperatives and Iranian interests uh, and the Iranian narrative. So that's one thing. Uh, as to, you know, and, and it's, it's deliberately sent out to trigger a response and gauge where the other side is, is there flexibility? Meanwhile, the back channels are humming along and there's a lot of communication that we don't find out about uh, until we get to the public di diplomacy level. Uh, the uh, CNN interview, I would call it an improvisation of that statement. You know, you, you, you're being posed certain questions, you have to answer them. And this is linked to what uh, no, but, uh, but, but hold on, my colleagues hold on, on the I, panel. I, I, Without prejudice to what you're saying, uh, I agree, a question posed to you, but nonetheless, he could have fallen back on uh, what he was arguing in his foreign affairs article, instead of coming up with this whole sort of idea of the, uh, you know, EU top official uh, somehow choreographing or synchronizing, uh, you know, steps by both sides simultaneously uh, in order to avoid the sequencing issue. Of course, and but bear in mind that after the foreign affairs article, you had the Macron uh, statement saying that, uh, look, you know, let's get the Saudis involved. They should be at the table. The Iranians pushed back on that, but they know that pushing back alone may not do the trick. So they're basically saying, we're willing to work with the Europeans, but in this format, in order to sort of, you know, hit two birds with one stone, the sequencing issue, because the Americans are saying, look, we're not going to do anything. And we have no reason to. Trump left us in a really good position with his po po um, you know, policy of maximum pressure. And it's your turn. Meanwhile, the Iranians can't give in either. So, uh, you know, this is Zarif. I mean, and, and as my co panelist said, you know, Zarif is not just sort of relaying his own, uh, you know, what he's being told by the, the top um, decision-making body, you know, you have to improvise, you know, they're not always there, new situations develop, and Zarif is known for, uh, if you will, uh, taking risks uh, on the home front. I mean, he's been, gotten into trouble with parliament. Uh, at one point, he did threaten to resign not too long ago because he was facing pressure from hardliners. And so this is a multi-level negotiation and, and multi-level game that is being played because, mind you, Zarif belongs to the president's camp, uh, which I re refer to as the pragmatic conservatives within the establishment. And then there are those, you know, there are multiple factions. So it's dealing with the, uh, the United States, dealing with the Europeans, and dealing with, it, uh, you know, uh, allies or rivals at home. Right. Now, it seems that uh, everyone agrees that there's a possibility that Jawad Zarif played off his own bat. To use a cricketing term, I know Iranians don't play it, but we do in Pakistan. So anyway, so the point is that, so there is the domestic politics, as, as Dr. Carl said, uh, then domestic politics on the US side also, the Iranian side also, multiple factions on the Iranian side, and then of course, signaling for multiple audiences. Now, therefore, how do you think, and you mentioned the Supreme National Security Council, how is this statement likely to go down with them? Uh, the United States has started this uh, whole containment strategy under Obama actually in order to maintain power, overall power, not just one part. So the nuclear deal is just uh, one small part of what the U.S. want. They want to contain Iran's missile, missile power and Iran's regional clout, and to the end, they want all parts of Iranian power contain. Uh, and in this, in doing this, they have two major weapons. Uh, it's more than leverage. It's uh, they they are called and they are used as weapons. That's one. sanctions. The other one is uh, credible military threat. Following what happened last year, the triple incidents in the Persian Gulf, uh, including the last one, the Iranian barrage of missile attacks on, on anal Assad at U.S. air base, it, uh, displayed uh, that the U.S. threats are no more credible because uh, Donald Trump threatened to strike back uh, 52 Iranian centers, cultural centers, and he never did that. Actually, the threat proved to be viewed and not credible. Now the U.S. has its only uh, a weapon, the sanctions. The tool is very important to the United States. You know, 
that Biden does not want to give it up because he wants to go this road to the end. Um, everyone knows that. And everyone knows how Obama treated Iran when he claimed that he would remove the secondary nuclear-related sanctions, but he never did that in practice. So there is Believe, uh, to, there is no reason for the Islamic Republic to believe that Biden would prove any different. So uh, Islamic Republic is very much distrustful of Biden and his intentions, I believe, correctly. And uh, what Mr. Zarif uh, uh, said, I believe, is like 15 years ago when he met al-Baradei, the former IAEA chief, at the Pantheon of Merabad International Airport. Um, he, were, he has been criticized for those statements that he made to Al-Baradi for all the past 15 years. He said, please help us stay in power, uh, give us a deal. Otherwise, the hardliners or principalists, they would come to power. Uh, that was a partisan move. That was domestic politics. It should have never happened by uh, a diplomat like Mr. Zarif. And I, 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 I'm looking at this new uh, position like that. I, I see it as uh, uh, an effort aimed at domestic politics for the reformist camp, uh, especially considering that we are just four or five months away from the presidential election, and their major claim and incentive and plan and scenario has always been uh, removing the sanctions through deals with the United States, and it never worked out, at least for the past seven years. Whenever the, Tehran has been in agreement with the United States ever since 2001 over Afghanistan to Iraq to the nuclear deal. Tehran has always been after a conflict resolution approach, and it's always been in compliance with the deals, according to American officials. In all these deals, Iran has complied with this. Uh, uh, okay, right. I, 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 I get that point. I get, I get that point, Mustafa. Uh, let me uh, go to Dr. Carlton Thaler. Uh, Dr. Carlton Thaler, um, there is clearly, and you mentioned in your previous intervention that the domestic uh, compulsions within Iran and uh, Kamran also talked about the various factions. And then the U.S. walking out of the deal and previously Obama not removing the secondary sanctions as most of us talked about. And then now at this point, Iran demanding, of course, the lifting of sanctions, uh, reparations, uh, and, of course, getting rid of the trigger mechanism. Now, if we look at these uh, preconditions and then we also look at uh, uh, Biden's own compulsions, uh, what would be your prognosis with reference to JCPOA that it could even take off uh, under the circumstances? I think if both sides stick to the demands that they have of the other, it's pretty much a non-starter. I think the idea of the United States government agreeing to reparations uh, is politically just impossible uh, in the United States. I think the best that Iran can get from the United States is that the United States uh, removes the sanctions that have been imposed since Donald Trump was in office. Um, but reparations is a political non-starter. I think it's going to be tough enough for Biden to get political support to go back to the agreement, um, because not everybody, even in the Democratic Party, is behind the idea of getting back into the agreement with Iran. Um, there's deep distrust of Iran in most political circles in the United States, and Biden Biden knows that. He knows that he, he doesn't have a huge depth of support on this issue, but it's considered very important because nuclear breakout for Iran would be very destabilizing for the Middle East, would be seen as a huge threat to uh, our allies in the region. So Biden's got a very tricky uh, set of cards to play in that he really, really wants to get to uh, a deal where Iran halts and reverses its nuclear uh, enrichment program, but at the same time, he doesn't look like he's completely caving into Iran. But that on the, on the other side, the Iranian government can't look like it's caving into the United States. I think that's part of the reason why Zarif said what he said is because there's a bit of desperation on the side of Iran and the, and the Biden administration to get a deal. And they know that their window is short. Right. Here's the point, uh, Dr. Gordon Teller. Uh, 
the Iranian economy has been under sanctions. I mean, the, the, this is the probably the severest sanctions regime that one can think of. And the economy tends to, like water perhaps, uh, find its way and it develops its own sort of, you know, self-sustaining mechanisms. And while Iran is hurting, uh, it, it, it's not uh, bending uh, and it's, it's, it's unlikely to uh, ultimately uh, comply with the U.S. demand. So given that, what exactly have the sanctions achieved? Uh, you know, I mean, they, they, they have not uh, achieved the purpose for which uh, they were imposed. They have not achieved the purpose for which uh, President Donald Trump walked out of the deal. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, Iran has found a way to kind of muddle through the sanctions, if you want to say that. It has been very a very painful economic experience for Iran, but Iran is not collapsing the way that Trump had predicted. At the same time, there's tremendous domestic pressure in Iran to get the sanctions relieved. And so the, the reformist camp, which is to a great degree held responsible for what's going on in the country, it's, the, it's viewed as, as basically governing the economy, it desperately wants those sanctions removed. Um, but the United States government is in a very tough place in that there's only so much it can do politically in order to get those sanctions removed. And so we, you know, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that we're gonna get back to a deal. Uh, I don't think it's, it's a foregone conclusion that it's impossible, but I think it will be very difficult for the Biden administration politically to lift sanctions if Iran doesn't look like it's cooperating very substantially. Precisely that, uh, the positions are so different, but thank you so much, that was Dr. Carl Colton Feller speaking with us. Kamran Bukhari, uh, this, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, by the looks of it, it seems that it's gonna be very, very difficult, uh, you know, domestic constraints. Uh, Biden, of course, has a domestic agenda also, and then, of course, the Republicans opposing the deal and lots of Democrats also. And then Iran, uh, basically digging in. Um, what is your prognosis? I don't think that the Biden administration is in any rush. It's not under any compulsion Correct. to uh, revive the old deal or get to a new one. It has time on its side. And that's why I keep saying that ironically, uh, the Trump administration's actions are working in favor of Biden because he inherited that situation. He's under no obligation to basically uh, go and say, okay, we need a deal. It's the Iranians who need the deal. That's why they're making the most noise, if you will. Note that there are not a whole lot of statements coming out from the Biden administration just yet, but uh, we do have it coming from uh, Tehran. Uh, so it, it's clear that it's in the Iranian interest. And mind you that the Iranians are, there may not be collapsing. Uh, states don't collapse that way. Uh, you know, if it's near collapse, then we're in a different world. But the pain is, is great. The financial pain is great. Uh, they're facing problems at home. They are constrained as to what they can do uh, and defend their power projection in the region. Uh, through Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen. And so it, it, they need, desperately need a deal. And so I think that that's where we are right now. Okay. Um, back to Mustafa Khoshesh. Mustafa, I've just got like two or three minutes left. Um, the pain is great. Uh, Tehran really wants the deal, uh, or shall we say, as you mentioned, the reformists want the deal. So in the event, uh, that the reformists are ousted from power in, in the coming elections and the hardliners take over, would Tehran still be desperate for a deal or would the situation change? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in about a couple of weeks from now, the parliament approval will come into force. That includes a stop of the voluntary implementation of the additional protocol to the MPTPT. Uh, the view uh, pursued by the Iranian parliament as well as the principalist camp is that we are, Iran is earning a better and stronger and stronger hand as the U.S. is losing its power in confrontation against Iran, not just because of domestic problems, but because 
uh, there are two pillars in this containment strategy that uh, the uh, credible threat is no more credible after last year events. And also the sanctions, they are losing their based on what the American experts and officials have been saying in the past decade, uh, the maximum efficiency period is no more than one and a half to two years. Even Obama said that. And the two-year-long period ended in last May. And the country, Iran, which is under uh, the uh, sanctions, uh, as well as it's also enduring the harsh coronavirus economic outcomes, still Tehran has scored a 3% increase in growth rate, according to World Bank, IMF, and others, and according to the Iranian Central Bank. So altogether, uh, the, uh, uh, it's the reformist camp who knows that if the government approve, if the parliament approval comes into force in about a couple of weeks from now, there will be lower chances, lesser chances for the U.S. to get back to the deal, and there uh, uh, they will lose the election, the presidential election. While the uh, the other camp, which is perceived to come into power and win the election, if nothing specific happens, if the, Biden doesn't come back to the. Uh, nuclear deal appropriately the way Iran wants, then uh, they believe that Iran would have a stronger and stronger hand. And they believe that Iran is n in no rush. That's why the Iranian leader, the parliament, the speaker, and many others, they are saying that we are not in a rush because the harshest time is gone. From now on, we have so many other leverages uh, to put on the U.S. The nuclear leverage is like 20 percent or 60 percent, 90 percent enrichment is just one part. Tehran has so many other fields to, uh, you know, pressure the United States and the Europeans. One is increasing the range of its ballistic missiles. The other one is opening up the gates to hundreds of thousands of uh, displaced people who would like to cross Iran to Europe. And you know the repercussions would be very catastrophic for the Europeans who uh, uh, experienced such a thing uh, a couple of years ago when the Afghans as well as Sri Lankans and many others crossed Iran into Europe and then uh, the Syrians, as well as others, joined them. And we saw the rise of right-wingers and radical rightists in Europe, in Austria, in uh, uh, England. We saw Brexit in France. We saw uh, Marie Le Pen's uh, uh, empowerment. Right. So I get that there point. will be political and socioeconomic repercussions for them. So Tehran has many options to leverage the United States and its European allies. That's why Iran is in no rush. Right. So the U.S. is in no rush. Iran is in no rush. So it seems that this is, at least in the foreseeable future, not going anywhere. But thank you so much, Mustafa Khosheshm. Thank you, Dr. Kamran Bukhari. We shall take a short break and return to discuss a report on Afghanistan violence by a Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction has said in a report that the U.S. military had reported that enemy-initiated attacks, that's the, the phrase used in the report, between October and December 2020, were higher than those in the same period in 2019. President Joe Biden's administration is going for a review of the peace deal between Taliban and the U.S., and Biden has said Taliban have failed to live up to commitments needed for a U.S. withdrawal. According to the U.S. Taliban deal, the United States must withdraw all its troops by May this year. The Biden administration hasn't formally changed the deadline, but Reuters reported on Sunday that international troops plan to stay in Afghanistan beyond the May deadline. Observers say the move could escalate tensions with the Taliban demanding full withdrawal. Let's get to our panel to figure out what's going on. Joined by David Sidney, senior associate with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Mariam Bardak, an Afghan journalist and commentator, and Rahimullah Yousafzai, resident editor of the news. Let me begin with David Sidney here. Uh, David, and I'm beginning with you because I know uh, we've been on this program discussing Afghanistan uh, several times, and I know that you're not particularly enamored of this deal. Um, why is it that it's 
always about the Taliban. I mean, the, the, the U.S. military's report talks about enemy-initiated action. So is Taliban uh, are not the only enemy. As a matter of fact, since the deal, there has been no hostilities between the Taliban and the U.S. and international troops. Well, uh, various representatives of the new administration here in Washington have been pretty clear about the uh, factors that are going to be looked at in the review that's ongoing. And it's important to stress it's a review. They've not made any decisions. Uh, the first is that uh, as um, uh, uh, national, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said the other day, uh, the Taliban have not abided by the uh, requirement of the, uh, of the deal with the United States to break all links with Al Qaeda. Uh, that uh, that counterterrorism aspect of the agreement uh, in many ways is the most important to the United States. And uh, this new administration is saying they don't see evidence that that's occurred. So that's one thing they'll be looking at. Uh, the second thing that they're looking at is the idea of reduction in violence. While the Taliban had claimed that there would be a reduction in violence, uh, there has been an increase in violence, including Taliban-initiated violence. Um, you can argue about whether some attacks on the margin might be from someplace else, but it's very clear uh, in Afghanistan uh, that the Taliban have sharply increased uh, the use of violence uh, since the February 2020 agreement with the United States. And then finally, the Taliban had committed to entering into serious negotiations with the Afghan uh, government. And the, uh, those negotiations are going nowhere, uh, according to all reports, because the, Af the Taliban are simply stating, we've won and you need to give us what we want. Uh, those aren't serious negotiations. So there's three important commitments that have been made. And uh, from the perspective of many people, uh, until they are met, uh, withdrawal, of course, will not be in the cards. Uh, but uh, again, there's going to be a review. Uh, the Taliban have an opportunity to bring themselves in compliance with the uh, with the various uh, requirements, and hopefully they will, and we'll be able to move forward. Right. Uh, I'm going to get back to you with reference to uh, reduction in violence and uh, negotiations. But uh, the first point, which is very interesting, I want to take that to Rahimullah Yusuf Zai. Uh, Rahimullah Yusuf Zai. Uh, this thing about Taliban links with Al-Qaeda, uh, as David Sidney just said, uh, uh, quoting Jake Sullivan, uh, what are your views about that? And what are your reports with reference to that? You know, we know that uh, the Taliban have not publicly declared that uh, they have dissociated from Al-Qaeda or say other militant groups. Uh, but they are claiming that, uh, you know, now there are no foreign militants in Afghanistan or in the areas controlled by them. They say that uh, there is no member of Al-Qaeda in their areas. These are their claims, although the Afghan government, uh, you know, and the UN report uh, had a different view. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, how many Al-Qaeda people are still there in Afghanistan? Uh, you know, are they really active? Uh, you know, we have been given different figures. Uh, you know, I think even uh, Mr. Mo uh, uh, Mike Pompeo at one point said there could be, say, less than 200. Other uh, say there may be even less than 100. And among them are families, uh, old Al-Qaeda members. So that is also a question. So that needs to be looked into and, you know, how active they are and how dangerous they are. But I think the commitment was made by Taliban and they have to live up to it. They have to fulfill this commitment. Right. Um, let me pull in Mariam Vardak here. Mariam Vardak, uh, the links with Al-Qaeda, uh, obviously I'm assuming that by links we mean uh, active links where Al-Qaeda cadres could be facilitated. Reduction in violence, uh, the Taliban never really uh, said that uh, there will be that. There, there, there have been ceasefires, but it was contingent upon successful negotiations. As far as the negotiations are concerned, the thir third point that David Sidney referred to, uh, there was a six-month delay because of the prisoner release issue. And then uh, there were other snags, and now the Taliban is saying, well, violence will be reduced. 
once we agree to a new power sharing formula, the Kabul government is saying you need to reduce violence before we get to that point. So give me your sense of where this is headed. Reflecting on the Taliban, I think that one of the things we should give them credit is that they've not changed, whether it's their stance on women, whether it's their stance on violence, whether it's their stance on military approach. But the one thing that they have been able to display very well is that if they call a ceasefire, there will be a ceasefire. And they've displayed that quite well two times in a row. I'm not placing them in any type of credibility and saying that they should come into government, but this is something that's been consistent. So for us to continuously to ask them to reduce violence, I, but I believe they're not going to do it, and I feel like these negotiations are not only a waste of time, but a waste of financial resources, especially since the WHO has mentioned that over 60% of the Afghan population are below poverty. I don't understand why we're allocating funds in areas where we know that are not successful. No, how many, no matter how many negotiations takes place, the Taliban will not change their stance. I think that the international community is well aware of this position. I think one, the fact that they might continue to keep the uh, international forces here is due to the fact that they realize that the Taliban are not going to change their stance. The other concerning matter that the Afghan Taliban have ties with al-Qaeda, of course they have ties with al-Qaeda. One of the main reasons why the United States has entered Afghanistan was due to their strong ties to al-Qaeda. And we also have to reflect on history that Osama bin Laden who was the leader of al-Qaeda, was the one who had helped the Afghan Mujahideen to fight against USSR. So there is this type of historical bond, the fact that bin Laden, or you know, the leader of al-Qaeda, and al-Qaeda had financially helped and with military, uh, provided military equipment to the Afghan people. These people feel that they have, they have this bond, this friendship that they shouldn't completely end. They're never going to and their ties with them until they're fully incorporated into the system. Once they're incorporated into the system and they're known as a legitimate system, then maybe United Nations and other organizations, international organizations, can call upon them to end these ties. But right now, they're still an Afghan insurgent group. They're still going to act like an Afghan insurgent group. Right. Now, these are very interesting points, but I just want you to clarify and define for me ties, because you know and I know we belong to the same part of the world. Uh, ties can mean many things. We, we uh, you know, there can be social ties, the fact that, you know, someone is your guest and so on and so forth. But that is very different from actually facilitating uh, a particular group or its cadres uh, to, to generate violence. So please define the idea of ties here. I understand that there are al-Qaeda activities based on reports that have been given by United Nations and the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. I believe that there's still social ties between all of these terrorist and insurgent groups, not only al-Qaeda, but the 27 other that are active in Afghanistan. Whether they are cultivating some sort of future attack on other, other on other nations or activities in Afghanistan I can't I can't say but I don't think that we should rule it out rule it out and I think uh, that everybody should take precautionary and they should continue to watch the check okay now when you say uh, that these talks are not going anywhere and since the Taliban haven't changed these talks will not go anywhere uh, what is the bottom line here? Uh, are you suggesting that this is an exercise in futility and uh, one needs to just, you know, leave this? Um, and if that is the case, then what's the alternative? You want to hold a dialogue. You hold a dialogue in a language that one understands. Mm -hmm. There is no use of sending um, people who are in complete opposite ends to have some sort of discussion discussion to lead up to some sort of conclusion. It's not going to happen. We don't, we have very few theological, uh, uh, very few Islamic scholars who can make theological arguments to the Afghan Taliban who seem to be fighting on the base of Islam. So I think that they're an absolute waste of time and an absolute waste of resources, yes. Right. Let me go back to David Neha. Uh, David, uh, <laughs> this prognosis seems uh, bleak even by uh, the bleakness that you know cloaks Afghanistan um, 
if these talks are useless, uh, my question remains, what is the alternative? Uh, is there a, and you're right, I mean, there's going to be a policy review, but no decisions have been taken. But as I said, Reuters report, report said, uh, this is a Sunday report, they said that there's a possibility uh, that the troops will stay. Well, in terms of the negotiations, uh, you will have seen from the U.S. administration a very strong statement of support for the talks, a very strong statement of support for peace. And that, I think, is what the United States' subjective will be in this review as to how to get to peace. But Mariam points out very strong institutional constraints and the situation on the ground, uh, and, and you know that I spend most of my time in Afghanistan, is that violence is up. Uh, the Taliban continue to control large areas of uh, Afghan territory. Af uh, Taliban sympathizers are, uh, are um, speaking up publicly. The Taliban uh, attacks in Kabul and other cities have led to a climate of fear uh, throughout Afghanistan. Um, and uh, the situation uh, for most people in Afghanistan is worse now than it was 11 months ago. So it's natural that people in Afghanistan will believe these talks are useless because they have not achieved anything positive. Uh, the one thing that the Taliban point to is that they are not that they are not killing American soldiers. But that's really irrelevant to Afghans because Afghans are not Americans. Uh, and so more, what happened is the Taliban the Taliban stopped uh, or killing Americans, but they start using those resources to kill more Afghans. And uh, I will uh, make the point, I've, you heard me made this before, Ajaz, until the killing stops, until the violence stops, um, then it's very difficult and probably impossible to have serious negotiations. The Taliban need to implement a ceasefire. As Maria Mordak has pointed out, if the Taliban want to implement a ceasefire, there will be a ceasefire. That The record is clear. When the Taliban stop fighting, attacks stop. Uh, so they can do that. Uh, it's up to them to stop the violence. Right. Well, I believe entirely agree with you that it's important to not just go for reduction in violence, but, uh, but a ceasefire. But obviously, uh, the Taliban seem to think differently. But thank you so much. That was David Sidney speaking with us. Raimula Yusuf Zai, any uh, final thoughts before I wrap up the program? Especially with reference <clears throat> to uh, violence and, and a ceasefire and also what Mariam said uh, about the talks being, you know, not really going anywhere. You know, Charles, uh, I think nobody, nobody thought that these talks are going to be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of skepticism. But even starting these talks, making Taliban agree to negotiate first with the Americans and now with the Afghan government, I believe is an achievement. And, uh, you know, this was unbelievable that the U.S. and Taliban would make a peace agreement, that Taliban would stop attacking the Americans and their allies, I mean the other NATO member countries, or that, uh, you know, the uh, U.S. would agree to withdraw troops in 14 months. So these are achievements of peace talks. These are not uh, uh, achieved because of any war. Now, the second thing is the inter afghan dialogue. Again, everybody believed these are going to be more challenging than the U.S. Taliban talks. And this is what is happening. So, but we have to be patient, you know. These talks have started, uh, uh, you know, they started in September. Uh, they have agreed on the rules of procedure. They were discussing the agenda, but then we had this stalemate. Uh, and now there's a review because both sides were waiting for the U.S. election. And everybody knew there would be a policy review by the Biden administration. Uh, that is going to happen. But uh, please tell me, what are the other options? As you have been asking, you know. Right, right. Uh, so the Americans, you know, even if they have a review, can they be, uh, uh, will they be able to send more troops to Afghanistan? Right. Do they still want a military solution? Uh, I think they will keep supporting these peace talks, and they will push. They will push the Taliban uh, to give some concessions, and they will also push the Afghan government. I think that is the way to go, because otherwise you cannot make these two very committed enemies with two different ideologies to make peace. 
Right. Um, very quickly, I've got a minute left. Mariam Vardak, any final thoughts with reference to what Raimullah Yousafzai has said? I think we need to understand that the Afghan Taliban have wanted to speak to the international community and the Afghan government since the Bonn Agreement. And I think that we need to be very mindful of the fact that they've been here waiting to discuss, but it was the Americans who did not want to, uh, did not want to speak to them and call them out as enemies. Now that the Americans have switched their policies and now their inter the rest of the international community is going to follow, follow soon, I think that one needs to be very understanding if the Afghan government and the Afghan people are not going to be switching as soon because they have more at stake here. As David Sidney very, uh, very carefully mentioned that it's Afghan lives at stake and it, it's them that are dying, dying. But it's so difficult because you have half the country who is a Taliban sympathizer. And then you have the other, the other half that is an enemy of the Afghan Taliban. But then it's so scattered in the fact that you have Afghan ISIS fighters. You have Afghans who are in other insurgent groups. It's very scary to be here. And I think I, it should be I, extremely... I, 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 completely, I completely agree with you. Uh, uh, you recall we, we did this program about the uh, killings of journalists and civil society activists and the rest of it. So I have no doubt that, uh, you know, being in Afghanistan is not uh, exactly a cakewalk for the common Afghan. But thank you so much, Mariam Vardak. Thank you to Rahimullah Yusuf Say as always. Um, this is all from In Focus this week, but I just want to remind you that uh, day after tomorrow, which is uh, 5th of February, is the Kashmir Solidarity Day. And uh, this day is obviously uh, uh, commemorated because uh, Pakistan wants to uh, give a signal, clear signal to the world that we stand with the Kashmiris. And it's also important to reiterate that this year, uh, just like last year, uh, this is a solidarity day where we also uh, have to uh, see clearly that an occupied territory, a territory that was already occupied, has also been illegally annexed by a right-wing BJP government in India. Anyway, as I said, this is all from In Focus this week. We shall see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at Indus.news. Good night and goodbye.